Hello, and welcome to Introducing Me. I'm your host, Sarah. I started this podcast to get to know other people and lifestyles while discovering more about myself. Each episode, I'll give a new guest a chance to discuss their background, culture, interests, or whatever they want to talk about to help increase all of our own worldviews. Today, I'd like to introduce you to Taylor. She is a millennial from Texas. She's a podcaster, live streamer. This has a lot of interesting things about her, so I'm excited to hear a little bit of her story. So Taylor, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Um, I am 31, so right smack in the middle of the uh, millennial uh, calendar, if you will. Um, born and raised in Texas from the Dallas-Fort Worth area. I'm currently in Austin, actually, um, and I have been for over 10 years now. Um, I'm not good at math, so 2008 to now. Let's go with that. Um, I am a podcaster. Uh, mainly my podcast is about life as a diabetic. I do have type 2 diabetes, um, and I share kind of my journey through that as well as perspectives of other diabetics, whether they're type 1, Modi, you know, there's so many different types nowadays. So I thought it was important to uh, get perspective on how people are thriving and living their everyday lives um, and whatever struggles they have and even connecting with allies. So other people in the wellness and nutrition field. Um, I literally had an endocrinologist that I recorded with last week, which was really cool um, as they're the primary doctors that a lot of diabetics see. Um, so it's just kind of my way of, of helping people see that they're not alone because that's how I felt. I was diagnosed at 25 and I wasn't sure how to you know, be a, a typical adult in your 20s trying to figure out career, trying to still party and all that. And you have this uh, condition that is life-threatening um, because you don't always see it. Um, which sounds pretty familiar considering the past year. Um, and, you know, it's it's surrounding your lifestyle. It's not just what food you eat is truly your lifestyle. So uh, the podcast, let's see, the season ends July 1st. I'm actually looking forward to it because I'm going on vacation to New Orleans that weekend. So it'll be nice to kind of have a break. And um, it'll be one year in August uh, that I've started it. So, um, yeah, it's been really cool there. Um, on the flip side, I have a live stream show. I just started live streaming on Twitch and YouTube um, a couple of weeks ago. It's not 100% consistent because I'm still trying to find my flow. And, you know, when you're when you're a podcaster, you're used to recording and talking to nobody anyway. So I'm like, okay, this should be, I should be able to do this, right? And then you get on live stream and people are actually reacting to you and you're like, okay, how do I make this flow like a talk show, but still engage with people? Because that's something that I really wanted to do. Um, and it's still, you know, be impactful. Um, it doesn't touch on my diabetic life. Uh, I mention it, but, um, you know, aside from being a diabetic, it's not who I am. And, and what I'm really passionate about is people being their authentic selves. Um, I'm all for taking up space and, you know, being true to who I am. Cause I spent so much time, um, hiding myself or, or switching my personality around to fit different spaces. Um, I grew up in a, um, very, a uh, strange cultural household in that, you know, my dad is black, my mom is Asian. Um, and so there was just kind of this constant shift of like, who the hell am I and how do I present myself? So uh, my live stream show is kind of tapping into that and in full self-acceptance from, you know, mind to um, how you interact at work to your body. Um, because I know that especially for women, that's a, a huge thing for us. So um, yeah, when I'm not doing that, I, I am a gamer, even though I don't stream gaming on Twitch. I do like to play video games. So it's it's really funny when people are like, oh, what games do you play? I'm like, I, okay, I play them, but I'm not streaming them. <laughs> so it's uh, it's been an interesting ride. Awesome. We have so much that we can talk about just from that short introduction. So why don't we start with diabetes and the fact that you weren't diagnosed until you were 25. So how did that come about that you got that diagnosis? Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because I have so many people that I've interacted with in the community who were diagnosed. I think my youngest guest uh, or the, one of my guests, the youngest that I've had has been four and I cannot imagine that at all. So, um, you know, I'm type two, which means that I'm insulin resistant. So my body makes the insulin, which is a, a natural hormone that we need, um, in order to, uh, provide energy to your cells. And so, my body creates it, but because of the amount of excess sugar in my system, my body has started to kind of, I think of it like a bouncer at a club 
where, you know, you step up and you're like, hey, I'm on the VIP list. And they're like, mm, don't see your name. So you're gonna have to go to the back of the line. Like, it's kind of like that. Um, so my body is to stop blocking off insulin and the sugar cells that it's trying to get to, to my cells and everything. And so um, both of my parents are type two. And I did learn that on my mom's side, it's, it's pretty prevalent. Both of my grandmothers have had it, all of that. So I am you know, doing some research into possibly genetic um, Modi, which is another form of diabetes, but has 15 sub forms of diabetes in it. Um, it's a genetic part of it. And so you can elude symptoms like someone who's type one, who is uh, insulin dependent, their body does not make either enough insulin or any at all. Um, or it can, you know, provide symptoms like type two, where you do produce it, but you might need medication to help utilize it. And so I wasn't fully aware of my parents being diabetics. My mom was diagnosed first. And all I knew was that everything was sugar-free and peanut butter and jelly tasted weird and I didn't like it. <laughs> and so um, later on, I noticed that my dad, probably my, maybe like five, six years later, I'm in high school at this point. Um, and I noticed my dad taking a lot of pills and some of them look like vitamins, but other ones I'm like, you know, I'm like, yo, what's going on? Why are you popping like a whole pharmacy every morning? And he's like, yeah, I, I got diabetes. I'm like, when did that happen? And, you know, granted, I don't expect people to make a whole parade when they're diagnosed with a condition that they didn't want, but it was just like, where the hell was I, you know? And so um, I was diagnosed in 2015. The year before, I actually tried to prevent my diagnosis, but I did it all the wrong ways. I was doing fad diets and all kinds of just you know, crap, basically, that just sent my my body into a spiral. But I, you know, I live in Austin now, my parents are still in Dallas. So I went home to go visit. And I remember sitting in the living room and asking my dad, like, hey, how did you even know? You know, like, from that, I know of when I get a physical, nobody's asking me to check to see if I'm diabetic. Now, I do tell everybody to ask and to get the blood work done, because it is a silent killer. Uh, diabetes is one of the top 10 deadliest diseases in the world. So I do encourage everybody, whenever you go get your, your yearly checkup, just ask for a screening. Um, if you ask for it, the doctors have to give it to you. So if they fight you on that, you might want to report them. Anyways, slight ramp. Um, I talked to my dad and he says, you know, the symptoms that I had is your body is trying to dump out all of the sugar in whatever way possible. So that looks like frequent urination, uh, dry, sticky mouth, which forces you to drink so that way you can flush everything out. Um, your eyes might leak because it, again, it's just another way to get excess sugar out of your system. Um, I didn't experience weight loss, uh, but I've have heard that like, you know, some people who, uh, find out that they're diabetic, they've lost weight. Um, wasn't a thing for me. I gained weight. <laughs> I was at my heaviest when I was diagnosed. Um, and, you know, I was having faint spells from my blood sugars being so low and, you know, all types of stuff. And so when we had that conversation, it came flooding back to me when I was thinking about, okay, I'm having all of these weird symptoms. You know, it got to a point I couldn't sleep through the night. I had to have a water bottle under my pillow because I would wake up in the middle of the night. My mouth would be so dry that I had to chug the whole water bottle just to like, like it felt like I was in a desert basically. Um, and so it was, um, you know, even to this day, I, I still sometimes have trouble sleeping completely through the night. And so um, I'm, I'm starting to think about these things and, you know, I'm like, hey, I feel like I remember something about this. And of course, Dr. Google was my best friend. And I started Googling the symptoms and I, you know, of course you see all of the like, dire, you're dying, basically, diagnoses come up. But I did see diabetes pop up and it triggered that memory of that. And then it took one good faint spell in the shower um, to make me be like, okay, I need to go to the doctor. And so sure enough, uh, I went in and they do two tests whenever you are um, being diagnosed. They do a blood test for a what they call hemoglobin A1C. All that does is they're able to see how coated are your blood cells in sugar? Because your blood cells live for about three to four months. And so it's common for you, for you to hear diabetics go in every three to four months to get this test done um, because they're able to look at, you know, the last three to four months of where your blood sugar levels are at, right? And then they also do a urine test, um, which, you know, checks a bunch of just a, a standard lipid panel test. Um, but when I got that done, they actually fast tracked my blood work, but my doctor came back. She said, just from your urine alone, you have a lot of sugar in your system. I'm pretty sure. 
is diabetes. And I'm like, oh, fun. And then wait about 15 more minutes. And she's like, yeah, your blood glucose levels are off the charts. Um, I think I was at 13%. A normal range is about 5.5% and under, give or take. Um, so for me to be at 13 and my blood sugar levels, um, which is the, the measurement whenever you prick your finger that you see a lot of people do, was around almost 400. Um, it's surprising that I didn't need to go to the hospital, to be quite honest. Um, but the fact that I got in in time and was able to get the medication I needed to start to control that um, was important. But it, uh, I, I guess I could say, no, I'll say it. I was fortunate to have symptoms because a lot of people don't. Um, and it isn't until you have to lose an eye or have to amputate um, a limb, usually feet uh, are, are the things to look out for that people find out. So um, yeah, it was a, a random conversation with my dad and experiencing those symptoms and one good knock to the head in the shower <laughs> for me to find out that I was a diabetic. And you said that it's not just a change in your diet. So what other lifestyle changes have you had to make since then? Yeah, um, sleep is probably one of the biggest ones. And of course, we hear about sleep for so many other things, but it really is that important. Um, movement. And I, I say movement very strategically because I don't want to come up here and say, you just need to exercise. Um, we are in a culture where we sit at our desk all day long, and especially with the pandemic, that was just amplified. Um, and so that's all I did most of the time. If I wasn't sitting at a desk, um, you know, in an office, then I was sitting on the couch at home. You know, I wasn't doing a lot to move around. Um, and, you know, thank God for Apple Watches, because that was one of my favorite features that they added is like stand up, because it was a great reminder that like, I'm literally just stagnant all day if I'm not even exercising, right? Um, and then I think the other thing, even though like I still eat what I want and, and I think there's a lot of misconceptions that you're not supposed to, or you can't, like I had a burger the other day and I was fine, you know, it's portions. And I think it's something that isn't looked at closely enough, um, especially because the American diet is so exorbitant in portions, you know, you go to all these different restaurants and things like that, and you're given three, sometimes four times the amount that you actually need. And so even just cutting down on portions uh, did a lot for me, you know, aside from changing sometimes what it is that I'm ordering. But um, those are probably the three biggest things that were huge shif shifts for me was getting sleep, actually, um, movement of some sort, and then uh, portions. And so what has the reaction been to your podcast? You know, the reaction that I've received so far has been, you know, uh, appreciation that it's real um, because, you know, I just had my recent endocrinology appointment and my, you know, A1C and I'm finally under 7%. Um, I'm at 6.7 and uh, the goal is to get to 5.5 because I'm working with my medical team to come off medication. It's something that I would like to uh, challenge myself to do, which is managing holistically. And you know, it's interesting because you sometimes see people with conditions and automatically assume that, oh, they've already got it figured out. You know, I'm listening to them because they've, they've beat it. They've got the cheat code, whatever. And I wanted to be honest in that. No, I'm still technically considered uncontrolled. And so to share that is hard, sure, because there is a bit of an achievement, a double achievement culture, I would say, within the diabetic community, because you already have it in just regular society. But in, in diabetic communities, you know, we're, we're doing a lot based off numbers and data, you know, your blood sugar levels every day, your A1C every couple of months, how many carbs you're eating. There's a lot of numbers that we deal with all the time. And so um, to just be upfront and that my numbers are sometimes crazy, my A1C is still considered uncontrolled, um, but I'm working through it, you know, has been really nice. I actually had a lady who DM'd me on Instagram from a guest episode that I did with one of my uh, online friends who's type one and her son was just diagnosed at nine. And so she was like, if it wasn't for y'all's episode, like me and his dad, we weren't sure really what to do or how he could be normal, you know, and, and it could, he, could he still do the things that he wanted to do? And 
I think to see the conversations happen from so many different perspectives, whether you have it or not, has been helpful to people and recognizing, you know, my, my tagline is you're no be a source for thriving with diabetes, because I don't want people to see it as this is a, what was me podcast? This is a, no, I'm going to live. I'm, I'm going to do the things that I want to do. I'm going to experience the world and I'm not going to allow this condition to stop me because that's what a lot of us think is life is over. I'm, I'm, I'm forever tied to maintenance mode for this condition. I can't travel. I can't um, go to a party and have cake. I can't drink. I can't, you know, do all of these things. And it's like, actually you can, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. That's the nobius part. <laughs> so I feel like people have been, you know, really receptive to it because um, I don't want to censor anybody's experiences, especially my own. And I think it's important that we share those stories because five, six years ago, I looked around and I couldn't find anybody online. And I want somebody to know that if they, if they were to Google something and my show pops up, I want them to feel like, you know what? I'm getting real raw information that doesn't make me feel like I need to be a mad scientist to know what I'm supposed to do. So that's great. And congratulations on getting to the year and getting your deserved vacation. Thank you. By the time this episode comes out, you'll um, have hit that milestone and you'll be, I would assume, starting on season two. Uh, four. Four. We're th- yeah. <laughs> I'm already three seasons in. <laughs> so how long are your seasons? Um, so they were pretty inconsistent at, at the beginning. So the first season was like 15 episodes. The second one was like 13 or 14. And then this third season, I finally got, I, I sat down and actually made a plan because I just needed to see if I was going to stick with it, to be quite honest. Um, and so this season I decided to do 30 episodes, um, because I was like teetering between doing a guest and then solo doing a guest and solo and, you know, a month flies by. And so I'm like, I don't want to lose the solo interaction, but I don't want to cut off access to great guests either. So I now have two episodes a week on Tuesdays are solos on Thursdays are guest episodes. And it's about a 15 week run. And then I, I factored in, um, like a six to eight week break in between. Um, so it's about a, I sound like an actual TV show, like a 15 week <laughs> season with two episodes per week. Very cool. Yes. So you'll be getting ready to gear up for year two. So Season four, we're still in year one. Year year one will be official in August. Um, so yeah, yeah, I, I I decided to pack in a lot in one year. Um, I'm I'm ambitious. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And to add live streaming onto that, so you said um, you know you're passionate about the authentic self. So can you talk a little bit about your live streaming? Yeah. So I knew I wanted to do something separate from my, my diabetic stuff, because sometimes it feels like your condition is, especially when you create something around it, it's like, that's just who you are. And I was like, no, it's something that I have and something that I'm willing to openly share, but that's not who Taylor is. So I had wanted to do something, um, separate that was more me, but starting healing in hindsight was my way to see, did I really want to do this? You know, cause now we're kind of in the, the age of the influencer. Um, and I had to deal with a lot of, you know, inner criticism and then, you know, thinking people were going to think weird things about me of like, Oh, she's trying to be an Instagram influencer. I'm like, no, I'm really not. Um, I just feel like there's not enough regular people sharing stories. I think we're seeing a, a bit of the, I've already crossed the success line. And so I wanted to get the podcast in flow first. And once I did that, I actually had considered doing a second podcast um, because the platform that I use to host with allows me to have unlimited. So I'm like, oh, that's great. I have room to to expand. And I've met with a couple people who have multiple shows and pick their brains on, you know, how sustainable is it basically. But something crept up in, you know, live streaming on YouTube and, and Instagram was becoming a thing. Um, and I never thought about this one platform that I'm actually on a lot, but I just never considered it for, you know, regular show and that's Twitch. And so I'm actually a moderator for a friend who does actually stream his gaming on Twitch and Twitch has expanded a lot and they have a whole separate category that's just, you know, talk shows and podcasts. And so I think one day uh, before he was getting ready to live stream, I was on it 
Um, and I'm looking around, I'm like, oh, people are running full on shows on Twitch. Like I've seen game shows, I've seen cooking competitions, I've seen podcasts, you know, and I'm like, huh. And what I appreciate about live streaming in general is you can interact with people. And that's one thing from the podcast side that can be difficult because you're like, hey guys, leave me a review of what you want to hear. Give me some feedback. DM me on Instagram, all the things. And you're trying not to do like a, I call it the YouTube spiel because I feel like that's where you see it the most of like, hit the bell, notifications, like and subscribe. You know, I, I, I don't want to do that. Um, and, you know, I know people have their, their weirdness against Apple podcasts, iTunes, whatever they're calling it now, you know, all of that. But because there's so many podcast platforms, I'm like, do I really want to list off, hey, leave me some feedback on Apple, Spotify, Google, Amazon. Like, no, I'm not doing that. So, you know, I'll just take it as is. And if people, you know, leave me feedback, great. So I started watching a lot of Twitch streamers and I watched a variety, some of them for games, because, you know, I, you know, I do like to play video games and it's cool to see people's um, skill and perspective on things. Um, but I started paying attention to the just chatting category and the talk show and podcast category. and. I'm watching really cool shows and to see people be able to immediately interact. Now you still have to deal with like, you know, on Instagram of building the audience, getting people to engage, you know, numbers, whatever. But especially since I'm not considered an affiliate or a partner, I can multi-stream to several platforms and I didn't want to do Facebook and that's a whole rant for another day. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to figure out YouTube. Um, it's something that's been, you know, um, it just feels like this very unique beast. I've, I've mainly stuck to Instagram because it, it seems Instagram at least likes to pull from all these other social medias and put it into one, which granted I get their biting off of different companies, but at the same time I can appreciate it because it's like one place to do all the things. Right. Um, but YouTube has been a space that I've, you know, admired from afar for a minute. I even started putting, um, you know, healing and hindsight on YouTube, uh, the video versions and all of that. And so I'm like, well, I can test out live streaming to YouTube and live streaming to Twitch. And Twitch has a bit more of that um, creativity in terms of like overlays and things like that. And, and YouTube, you can do the same, um, but I've noticed you see more of it on Twitch and I, and I liked that. So I decided, why not? Let's, let's go out on a limb. Let's um, talk to your, your friends that stream on a regular basis. Let's get their feedback. Let's, you know, pitch to them your, your idea. Because I'm, I, when people ask me like, oh, what do you stream? It's like, I'm a talk show streamer. Um, and I was nervous that, you know, it's not really going to be appealing to people. But even the friends that I've made on Twitch who do stream games have gone to my profile live on their stream and just like put my face all up on their stuff, which I appreciate, appreciate the exposure. Um, and they love what they're seeing. And I'm like, cool. Well, I guess we'll, we'll rock with this. Um, it's just the element of, you know, you respect TV talk show hosts a lot more because granted, I don't have a fancy studio uh, like they do, but like having to do all of this live and you know, all of these things, you, I think it's just a different set of challenges that I didn't expect because I'm like, Hey, I podcast on a regular basis. I've got my spiel. I've got my flow. But now that I'm doing stuff that is truly coming from me, it, 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 it was a little bit harder than I thought, you know, of like, is what I'm saying valuable? Are people going to pay attention? Are people going to care? You know, and you can easily get in your head about, um, vanity metrics and, and all of that stuff. And so, it's, it's been great. And even on the days where I might only have one person watching, it just kind of helps me snap into that podcast flow of like, my messaging is I want somebody to come across this and be like, you know what, I struggle with just being me. And with all the social and civil unrest that's been going on, I think this is the perfect time for people to wake up and realize it is absolutely okay to be yourself. And, and all of these rules, they were never designed for us in the first place. They were designed for people who were uncomfortable with themselves and decided, you know what, I've got the power to make other people do what I want. So instead of growing up a bit and being myself, I'll make other people do what I want. And I say, damn that, let's, let's uh, flip the table and do our own thing. So that's where the, uh, the live stream show came from. That's super great. And I'll make sure to leave links to both your uh, Twitch channel and your podcast in the description of this episode. 
So talking a little bit about growing up, you know, you're mixed, your dad is black, your mom is Asian. What sort of things, just things in general, did that lead to? Yeah, so my mom is, so my mom's technically mixed too, um, but more Asian than black, but she's from Chiang Mai, Thailand. Uh, My grandpa was in the Air Force, so he was stationed out there. Um, And then when she was about nine, 10 years old, uh, they came to the States and settled in Bossier, Louisiana, uh, close to the Air Force Base there. Um, And so it's funny because my parents grew up 15 minutes away from each other. Um, My mom was in Bossier. My dad was in Shreveport. And they didn't meet until Dallas way later. And it was actually my aunt um, on my dad's side who my mom met and she needed a ride home. And so they're like, where are you? I was like, oh, in Bossier. And she's like, oh, that's like 15 minutes from where we're from. Um, and so they met at a gas station. My dad was going to be the one driving. And that's how they met. So every time I'm in Dallas and we pass the uh, the gas station where they met, we're like, oh, cute, right? <laughs> um, so, you know, I grew up with two different types of cooking. Um, and, you know, obviously an English household mostly, but when I was with my mom's side of the family, you know, my grandmother spoke Thai. Um, my grandpa um, didn't, he spoke it, but he, I never heard him spoke. He knew enough to survive in Thailand when he was on, you know, on, on mission out there. Um, but my grandmother could understand English, you know, uh, even though her English uh, speaking back was pretty broken. And so it was these two wide open cultures where you have you know, the uh, quote unquote African-American culture, or or I know now there's, there's debate between, is it African-American culture or black culture? I'll say black culture because I didn't have any African influences on my dad's side growing up, but I understand, you know, the history from that. Um, And, you know, he grew up on a lake. um, So fishing and hunting and, you know, the whole soul food aspect and gardening that that's what he knew and understood, you know, kind of country life. Right. And my mom knew life in the jungle until she came to the States. And so there's these different morals and values that you see between the two of them that ultimately flow together. But, you know, there's the kind of aspect on the Asian side of like respecting your elders and you don't really see, um, you know, kids talking back, things like that. That was kind of a a thing. But in Thai culture, it's a little different um, because they're one of the only, you know, Asian countries that hadn't been conquered by somebody or colonized by somebody, right? Um, and so they're considered, uh, a lot of times the dirty Asians, um, which are like the Southern Asian countries, um, that usually they're closer to the sun. So they're a lot darker, things like that versus like, uh, you know, China, Japan, um, even Korea, where you see that these kind of glorified Asian cultures, cause you see that they're the ones, um, who are highly educated and are constantly in the books. And, and it's kind of the opposite, you know, uh, for those Southern cultures. So there's even that. Um, I didn't find a lot of Thai people growing up. It was just my family. Um, you know, Vietnamese was probably the most that she ran into a lot of the times. Um, language barriers, of course, um, food and, you know, different levels of what was important. Um, you know, my mom very much taught me to keep a job, keep it a car, you know, uh, grind, um, you know, because of having to grow up, uh, my parents were born in 67. So there's still a lot of the heavy civil unrest that's going on and add to that being Asian and black, you know, cause I did have, um, other mixed, uh, Blasian, uh, family members, if you will. And so you're battling that norm. And then, you know, my dad is only just battling being black. Right. And so you have all of these different, um, things that are just kind of this melting pot of experiences. And so you put that under one roof And you see, you know, this ethics of don't, like nothing's free, right? You need to work for what you get uh, for my mom. And especially for her as a woman, like if somebody tries to hang something over your head, get it yourself. Like don't let somebody use something that you want. Like you can get it yourself, right? There was a big push for school and college because my mom couldn't go. She had a Um, my grandmother actually had an experience with one of my, I guess you could say ex uncles now, um, who was a college man and he took advantage of my aunt, things like that. So in my grandmother's mind, college educated people 
were assholes <laughs> and they, you know, were going to come in and, and, and drain your drive, your money and treat you terribly and all these things. So when it came to my mom going to school, you know, she couldn't do it because it was just like, no, you're going to turn into one of them. And so opportunities were huge for my mom. Every extracurricular that I did was like, hey, can you find one and stick with it? Like that could get you a scholarship that could get you into school. And I'm like, I just want to try stuff. Like that's the kid that I was like, I want to try everything. My dad understood that because he had a lot of flexibility growing up. He was a musician. He loved computers. Um, he was playing gigs, things like that. So it was kind of this constant teetering of like, I'm getting a lot of emotional nurturing from my dad and, and creative expression from my dad and a lot of discipline and, um, you know, rein it in and keep your head down and be quiet from my mom, which for a typical American household, you usually see the opposite where it's the mother who's nurturing and the father who's kind of the disciplinary. I still was, but you know, we could talk about, I, my mom literally said to me one time, you want to talk about your feelings, go talk to your dad. I'm not it, <laughs> you know? And so it created this fun yet strange dynamic because if my feelings were hurt or I felt bad about something, like I wasn't running to mom. And there even was a period where I thought my mom didn't like me. Like she doesn't, you know, I'm seeing all these mother daughter relationships happen. And, you know, my sister, she and I, um, we share our dad, but we have different moms. And so they have a great relationship. I'm like, why don't I have that? You know? And it's because my mom grew up in a household where like my grandmother was hustling. There were six of them. So there wasn't time to have that relationship, you know, and that's what she knew and understood. I take care of you. You're, you're clothed, you're fed, you're able to go to school, do the things. That's me being a good mom, you know, not having a, a relationship. Now, now it's completely different. I sometimes freak out when she gets emotional on me. I'm like, who are you and what have you done with my mother? Like, she doesn't fall for these emotional traps. What's happening? But it's cute because it's like, I, as an adult can process that better and I can see her growth and I can see her softening and we can have real conversations because there's not the barrier of I'm a child, you know, granted, she still sometimes treats me like one, but I'm willing to vocalize my defiance of you're not going to talk to me like I'm a kid anymore, mom. It's okay. <laughs> but, um, it was very interesting. And, and from the food, I, if I could go back to 10 year old me just to eat, I would. Cause you know, fried chicken on one side and, you know, Thai people actually make pho a lot. Actually, it's 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 quite a common dish, uh, but they call it guitil. So I ate a lot of pho growing up. <laughs> before it was cool, I was on sriracha. Before it was cool, all of that. So when that started popping up everywhere, and everybody's like, "Oh yeah, Thai food," I'm like, "I grew up with that." What y'all are just now catching on? Cool. Um, but yeah, I had soul food on one side and really great Thai food, and sometimes a mixture of Vietnamese food on the other side, and it it taught me how to be with other people who were different than me because I had a constant contradiction running around <laughs> in my upbringing. I have cousins who are, who are black, white, and Asian, you know, like my mom's side of them were really mixed. So I didn't see the social issues that I see now until I got to like middle school. You know, I, I it was so above my head. Cause I'm like, yeah, I've got a cousin with blonde hair and blue eyes and I've got a cousin with dark hair. And you know, it's just like that we're just family. That's all I know, you know? And so um, I appreciate it because it taught me people, taught me humanity um, versus differences. And so um, it's funny to this day, though, uh, whenever my mom's, you know, Laos is, uh, is, uh, Laos is the next country over. And they're very similar, um, slight language differences. But my mom made a lot of Laos friends and I grew up with a lot of them. So they're, they're pretty much family to me. Um, and so to see my dad you know, saying the names of these dishes, like he's, you know, authentically from Thailand or Laos. It's just like really cool. But we also know that my dad's super bougie. So he could not survive out there as hot as it is without like a five-star hotel. Like he's not going to pop a squat in a shack ever. Like jungle for him? No. So it's, I wouldn't change it for the world. It was, it was a great upbringing. And I, I love both of my cultures and, um, you know, they mean a lot to me to represent both. And have you been able to keep some of that culture in your day to day now not living with them? Yeah, um, I, to the best of my ability, you know, you always second guess if it's as good as mom's, but I cook Thai food. Um, I've introduced my partner, you know, to, to Thai food. Um, and sometimes when we go to different restaurants that have it, um, I actually take on what we used to do with my grandmother. She's passed now, but we used to bring her into town and take her to different Thai restaurants to see um if she felt like it was authentic. Cause my mom is from Northern Thailand and that's more earthy, more spicy. Like 
I say my family eats lava. It's true. Um, Southern Thai, which is like where Bangkok and Phuket and all that are, is where you get like the pad Thai and like the peanut sauce on everything and everything's really sweet. That's not really Thai food. And then yet a lot of the p- places that have popped up in the States, that's what they latch on to, right? So if I see pad Thai, I roll my eyes because I'm like, that ain't real Thai. I mean, it is, but there's real, real, <laughs> you know? So we used to take her to different restaurants and she would take two bites and not once, even in, up until she passed, she would go, mm-mm. And that just meant it ain't uh, it ain't mine or it ain't like back home. And so now I've kind of taken up that mantle of like, I'll go to different Thai places and I'll look at the menu. And if they put the actual name versus like the English name, that's sign number one that I like. If I recognize multiple dishes that haven't been commercialized, sign number two that I like. And then of course, eating it. Um, and so it's kind of the same. It's just like, oh, they buried it in peanuts. Jeez. Oh. It's super, super sweet. And it's, this is supposed to be like burning my throat right now, you know? So it's kind of like having her with me in in that journey of that. Um, You know, it it is a goal of mine to be able to relearn the language. I could speak a little bit when I was a kid because it was how I communicated with my grandmother. And I used to watch uh, Thai TV with her all the time. But I, outside of like hi and a curse word or two, like, which is her doing, she used to teach me curse words and have me go say them to her friends because she thought it was funny. <laughs> and so, you know, I do want to be able to speak again. One of my cousins actually did a world teach program out there and she just decided to up and move because uh, I do technically have citizenship there. I just have to file the paperwork and I could be a dual citizen um, here in the States and in Thailand. And I, I would like to do that. Um, but I think that's the next big hurdle for me is uh, being able to truly connect with the language of my culture so I can understand. Um, there's actually a Thai Netflix show that I've been watching to just retrain my ears um, to, to hearing it. And um, yeah, it's, it's special to, you know, the land of smiles, which I love, you know? And so um, it is definitely a goal to, to be deeper connected and to, you know, go visit with my mom together. Cause we haven't been together. We've both been separately, but um, yeah, to be able to reconnect with that. And when you visited Thailand in the past, what were your experiences like? So I was still a kid back when, you know, sending kids on a plane overseas or anywhere was no problem. You know, you could wait at the gate for your child. Um, I'm telling my age here because I'm pretty sure everybody's like, what? They do that? Yeah, they used to do that, y'all. Um, you know, it was interesting because obviously being fully immersed um, made it easy to acclimate to the language, if you will. Um, I thought I was going to stick out like a sore thumb because I'm darker and then the sun is 24-7 there, so I'm getting even darker, but not really because they're they're out there all the time. And only when you start to spend time away, you know, my mom jokes about like, I need a tan. Because it's like she's way more light skinned. I'm like, does it even matter, Mother? Like, seriously, <laughs> you know, like stuff like silly stuff like that. But I really thought that I was gonna stick out. And outside of my hair, no, we just literally run around the jungle and we could eat while we were out. Um, one of my cousins always had like a machete and a pocket knife. We would just climb trees and pull down fruit, um, hit a sugarcane field, snap one of that, suck on that while we're running around, mangoes, bananas, you name it. Like, And that was such an awesome experience to have because it made sense when my mom was like, yeah, when we moved here, we hated it because we would go out to the forest to play and we'd come back starving. It's just like, there's no food here, you know, because that's what they're used to. They're used to the jungle just producing everything. And, you know, so it, it, it taught me so much and it taught me humility pretty early because a concrete warehouse was like a mansion, you know, versus like bamboo shacks and things like that, or tin shacks. And it's hundred degrees all the time. Like you think Texas is hot and humid, like you're constantly sweating. I'm pretty sure I came back 20 pounds lighter and wasn't even planning on it, you know? And so, um, you see how happy everybody is. And you're just like, how? Like, you don't have air conditioning. You don't have uh, sometimes flushing toilets. Like, you don't have this, you don't have that. How are you running around smiling? How are you running around just, you know, living? And and, and here I come from the States, almost like a spoiled brat with all of these comforts and video games and all these things. And it's just like, man, they they would give up everything just to have this one thing that I have. Or they have no clue what this experience is. What's chocolate? You know, chocolate is like, what? You were able to go into the city and get candy? Like, you know, it's stuff like that where you're just like, I really got it great. 
you know, and, and I already wasn't one to, to truly complain. I'd want stuff all the time. I used to sit in front of the TV and every toy commercial be like, I want that. I want that. But I never pressed my parents like that because I understood the money situation. I think, you know, to that extent, sometimes our parents don't know how much we understood back then. Um, but I did understand, you know, when I would hear them talk about bills and stuff, it's like, okay, don't ask for anything. Don't ask for new clothes. Even though my shoes would be too tight, like don't, because, you know, they're trying to make ends meet. And when you come from that space where you see your, your family, um, abroad living like that, it makes you really feel, I don't want to say bad looking back at the time when I was a kid, I did feel bad, but now it's just like, it was just an opportunity to understand perspective. And that's one of my my values is perspective, value perspective over everything, because what I see through one lens, somebody else is seeing through a different one. And I shouldn't assume that everybody sees things my way. I should be open to seeing things other people's ways and uh, appreciate that because it might teach me something. So yeah, getting to, to go over there pretty early on. And I think that was the lesson that my mom wanted in a way of sending me over there. It was just like, yeah, we're here, but see where we could have been, you know, had, had she stayed in Thailand, that might've been where I was going to be, you know? So it, it's, it's, um, just giving really great perspective. Definitely. Now, have you, you kind of offhand mentioned something about like middle school, kind of realizing probably that like race was a thing mm-hmm. or that it, a problematic in quotes thing, even though it, it shouldn't be. So what sort of experiences have you had, um, like that? I think one of the first ones that I experienced was, um, it was actually at a summer, summer day camp, um, where one of the counselors saw that my mom was mixed. Right. And, and my, I'm used to people hitting on my mom like crazy because, you know, Blasian is pretty awesome mix. Right. <laughs> but, you know, he would joke around and call me Jap. And if you're not familiar, that was kind of one of the you know, slang terms for Japanese people, um, and sometimes chink, um, which is kind of the equivalent for N word for Chinese people. Um, and so to have those being said to me, I didn't fully understand it until someone kind of pulled him aside. It's like, Hey, can you not like, Oh, we just joking around. And it's just like, and, and this, and this is a black counselor on top of that. So it's just like, you see this big historical rift between the black community and the Asian community. And to see someone say, well, it's not as bad as what we got, you know, like those were kind of the, the experiences and battles I had to face is like, I was constantly in the middle of not being black enough, not being Asian enough. And to see the strife between the two communities and having experienced it, I do look more black than I do Asian. So I have experience going into Asian markets and things like that and being followed around and, you know, people automatically assuming that I'm going to have just this like this hood ratchet, hey girl, hey, you know, kind of accent all the time or, you know, to be in the black community and to mention that, you know, I am mixed with Asian and now all of a sudden guys pay attention to me because I'm exotic and I'm something to be, you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm a fetish, essentially, because you don't see that uh, mixing a lot of times, especially Thai. Um, so the more specific, the more interesting it is sometimes. And so I didn't fully feel the weight of those until college years. But in high school, it was just like hard to navigate in circles because like, hey, I want to go hang out with Asian kids and talk to them about stuff. And they're just kind of like, why are you here? And even though it's it's not, you know, I, there's usually more Korean and Vietnamese. Um, there, there was a couple Laos and I, there was one girl in elementary school who's Cambodian and she didn't care. Like she was so, ex- so excited that I even knew half the stuff she was talking about. But aside from her, like, Hey, yeah, I know what sticky rice is. Hey, yeah, I know what this is. Hey, yeah, I've eaten that before. I love kimchi. What? You know, like, it was just like, are you just like trying to like, could your own people not take you? Right. And then to go to the black side and, you know, if I bring something from home. For lunch, you know, you, you hear a lot of Asian kids talk about bringing their cultural foods. I went through that. And that's just because the shit is good. So, you know, why wouldn't I eat it at lunch for school if I, if I didn't have to buy pizza? And people would be like, oh, that smells. What is that? Like, why are you eating that? Oh, it's probably a dog or a cat, huh? Like, you know, stuff like that, that you're just like, I don't understand what's so wrong with me just doing what I know is normal, you know? And so um, it's, 
it chipped at me little by little. Um, and I wasn't, you know, the, I was the, I was the ugly duckling, if you will, in school, you know, I was, I was overweight. Um, my, my teeth were all kind of crazy before it braces and all that. And so I just made myself to be the overly talkative, trying to be funny guys, girl, you know, that was kind of me. Um, even though I wanted, I tried so hard to hang out with the pretty girls and, you know, they tolerated me. Um, but it was so easy to throw me under the bus when it was convenient for them, you know? So it was hard to try to exist because you're trying to impress your white friends. But at the same time, you're trying to let your black friends know that you're still there. And at the same time, you're trying to be like, Hey, Asian friends, I kind of know where you're coming from. And you're just kind of just hopping around these different circles, trying to figure out which one do I belong to? And, and that's kind of where the um, title for my live stream show is a room for me kind of came from was, you know, trying to figure out which table I can sit at, at lunch. You know, do I hang out with these people or these people or these people? And finally getting to a point of I'll just sit by myself and people started slowly coming and sitting with me. And so, um, you know, even now it's, it's hard sometimes because you have the AAPI situation that's been going on and me feeling for that. But because I don't look immediately until you like stare at me for a second that I'm Asian, people are like, oh, you're an ally. I'm like, yes, but also I am Asian too. <laughs> and so then you have all of like the Black Lives Matter things come up and I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm black too, you know, so I'm, I'm here for that too. And then you see again, the bubble up of the black community and the Asian community kind of trying to figure out how do we coexist for each other? Because we both went through traumatic stuff, but one kind of had a, you know, choice to come, the other kind of didn't. And you know, you, you don't know where to, to have these things and you see, you know, Asian shops popping up in black communities and benefiting off of things that the black community creates and, and constantly does. I'm thinking of hair shops, you know, stuff like that. And, and just all this back and forth and I'm right smack in the middle. Cause it's like, I get both sides. I get that the Asian community bands together and they keep their money circulating all together. And we tried to do it, but then white America decided to tear it all down, you know? And then we, now we're kind of just everybody to themselves. And now we're trying to figure out how to come back together. And it's just like, okay, well, how do we cross integrate? How do we, you know, make these things connect and, and feel cohesive and even conversations I've seen, uh, especially on clubhouse of like, uh, people saying that mixed babies are the answer. And I'm here to tell you as a mixed baby, we are not the answer. The issues will still be there if we don't, you know, resolve them. Like me being mixed has made things hard because it's one to not be accepted as one thing, but I'm getting double rejected sometimes. And that leaves you in this pit of like, who the hell am I? And, and so, um, you know, civil unrest issues, I found myself just naturally wanting to speak out or at least be willing to be in those circles because I don't think people recognize um, how traumatizing it is when you've got both sides, when you have to worry about your dad getting pulled over, but also worrying about people targeting your mom and, and you know, fetishizing her and, and all these things. And so it's just like, I got to call in Black and Asian sometimes. Like, I'm out. I can't. I need to to go sit in a corner by myself and just be because there's so much going on and I care deeply and evenly about both. And, you know, sometimes you feel like you have to prove yourself to both sides. It's like, no, can I just be me and be for everybody? Can I just do that? Is that okay? You know, so it's, it's tough. Thank God for therapy. <laughs> and, and your passion for both really does come through, um, and the way that you speak and, um, you, you seem to have a, a decent handle on the situation to be able to, uh, handle both sides. Thanks. You're welcome. Now, before we wrap up, is there anything else that you would like to share with the listeners? Um, I think the only thing that I would like to share to anybody listening to my stories, one, thank you, if you listen to my, uh, my rantings a bit. Um, but I think no matter what your condition, your background, your um, cultural upbringing, whatever, I think it's just important to remember that being you is okay. Um, and that you should celebrate yourself no matter what it is, if it's a small wind of checking off your to-do list, even if it's only a couple of things or um, getting up and, and being able to get out of the house for a little bit or um, speaking up for yourself and advocating for yourself in whatever environment situation that you're in, whether that's the uh, classroom, the boardroom or your bedroom. Um, I just want people to know that it is okay to exist as you are and not feel compelled to follow society's rules 
because at the end of the day, they weren't really designed for us. And it's okay to break them and make your own as long as it's safe and not harming people. Let me be very clear about that. Okay. But be you because you're a badass. I love that. Now with all of my guests at the end, I ask a random question that doesn't have to do with anything else. My question for you is dead or alive, who would you like to sit down and have a meal with? Oh, that's hard. Oh, that's so hard. Okay, the first person that popped into my mind is the uh, psychologist Carl Jung. Um, He's the one that came up with um, the different archetypes, personality archetypes, uh, the idea of, of the shadow self and the basis of shadow work all of that. Um, you know, as someone who does a lot of shadow work, I've found it to be so fascinating of, you know, his theories on diving into self and understanding self. And as someone who is in constant, you know, I I think self acceptance is a never ending journey, um, because you evolve as you get older and go through different experiences. Um, I would love to just pick his brain on how he saw the world you know, especially being a uh, European and things like that. And, you know, his view of Western culture. And when you came up with these archetypes, like, you know, how did they, um, how did he see them impacting the world? You know, and a lot of people use his work um, as a foundation for a lot of things. And I loved psychologists and philosophers. I'd probably say Socrates would be my second one. Um, Cause I feel like they asked why and they didn't care where you came from. You know, they were just like, well, you're angry. Why are those things? Because they're Roman. Okay. What's so bad about being a Roman? What they do to you? Like, you know, like let's have a dialogue. And I'm a true believer in the art of conversation. And I feel like if the art of conversation was taught so early on, um, especially in politics, I don't think we'd be in the situation that we'd be in right now because we would be able to talk to people without immediately um, getting emotional because someone says something that we, we can't understand. You know, so that's the first that came to mind. But there's a there's a laundry list of people that I would want to have a Jesus style last supper like dinner with. <laughs> All right, that brings this episode to a close. As I mentioned earlier, I will be leaving Taylor's podcast and Twitch channels in the description along with her Instagram, her personal Instagram and the Instagram for the show. So feel free to go check those out, give her a follow on those sites. And if you'd like to connect with us, our podcast website is in the description as usual. So that can take you to our Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Patreon. If you like what you're hearing, we'd love to have your monetary support. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, I'm always looking for new people to talk to, to share their stories. So feel free to send me an email. Thank you, Taylor, so much for spending time with me today and to my listeners for taking the time out of your day to hear a new story. Until next time. Bye. Thanks, y'all.